Hello, everyone. So wonderful to see so many of you in the audience, and uh, hello to the next room as well. We'd like to acknowledge that we are, of course, on Aboriginal land and acknowledge traditional owners. I'd like to pay a special acknowledgement to the Ghana people on whose land I live and work every day. Natalia. We are going to... We're going to do what we've done a few times before, but it's not going to be like any other time before because we kind of have a pact with each other to never go over the same ground as much as possible. So the, the focus for this morning's conversation will be, of course, on Ben's practice. And we've selected the images that are rolling behind us here to take you to the studio. Now, fortunately, the studio has actually come to you here in Brisbane via the children's activity space. You have an opportunity via the CAC. You have an opportunity to pretty much step into your studio. And there are reproductions as well as objects from barnacled with paint, objects from Ben's studio in that particular space. But we're going to start by travelling and thinking about a day in the life of. And I think... I love that image in particular. I'd like to start by kind of... I know what your day looked like today, but I think people would be really curious to know what your day looks like. And I'd just like to make a special acknowledgement that both Joe and Liv are in the audience, Ben's two children, and, uh, of course, they're an essential part of, your, of a typical day for you. So give us a sense of how it happens, because it's... I imagine it seems from the outside, and certainly for me... It, it seems a completely phenomenal, curious and, and wondrous thing that Ben Forty gets into his studio at all. He is so kind of pushed and pulled by so many people and, and so many causes, for want of a better word, that I'm surprised you even get there. What does a day look like? Well, I, I look forward to school holidays. Because <laughs> the three of us end up in the studio. Studio is a good... And that little one can come too. Um... <laughs> I um, Joe and Livy like having school, um, their birthday parties in the studio. It's a pretty laid back space. You can trash everything in there. There's no white gloves. Um, and, uh, and you can use all the materials that you want, aerosol, oil paint, whatever you need to use, clay, sculptures. We've made sculptures together in there. Joe's got his own little section that he takes control of. He's been making a still life recently of a, a pop, a beautiful pot plant painting. Um, um, getting worried that Joe's ability is going to start outshining me. So <laughs> we're discouraging from future in the arts. <laughs> Joe, check out that there's a really great Weaver Hawkins painting that's in the Margaret Ollie exhibition. No, don't tell him to do that. Oh, OK, sorry. sorry. He's seen enough. Joe, I can be your curator too. <laughs> I, just I beg your pardon. Just saying, just saying, just saying. Um, I don't know, some of you might have seen Joe and I on 7.30 report the other night. And Joe and Livy flew in yesterday with Kylie, who's not there um, here today. She had needed a rest. Um, <laughs> she um, flew in and said they're arguing with each other. And Livy said to me, Daddy, Joe's very nice on TV, but he's not so nice when he's not on TV. <laughs> and I think that's probably like all celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> so, <brilliant. laughs> so the studio is an industrial scaled studio uh, and it has a couple of different chambers and one of them is more kind of administrative and social if you like where there'll be other people and then there is the inner sanctum and Ben is often there even though he's just described a very kind of social setup in the studio when you're in there you're often in there alone. Yes, yes, that's right. So the studio, we live a few hours out of Sydney. So I, we started doing all of the making canvases and crates for travel. Um, and I ended up buying all the machinery you need to make the stretches and to stretch the stretches because it costs so much to get them down the highway when we moved down 12 years ago. We both, Kylie and I, had very little money and it was hard to, to survive as an artist. And before Joe was born, I was really... Kylie was supporting me. Mm. Um, so when he was born, we moved there. I needed to step up, really, at that point. And um, so then there's now four people that work in the studio, but they're only there two days a week, so everyone's there for a short period of time. And you're right, the stu where I actually work, which most of these photos are of, that's Joe's painting there. 
Not very good, is it? <laughs> um, see, it put me off again. <laughs> um, the studio, I've always... I mean, I remember as a young man, and Lisa and I, Lisa and I met when Lisa was teaching at high art school. Uh, sorry, high school art teacher in Western Sydney, and I was from North Western Sydney. Um, and I was a builder's labourer around that time, and I worked full time as a builder's labourer for four years after art school. Uh, and you learn how to work hard. You learn how to get up in the morning, and go to work. And one of the questions I always hear is, "Do you get writer's block?" Um, mm. I, and I've forgotten the artist now. It was a great, Chuck Close said mm. that uh, um, that inspiration is for amateur, amateurs. The rest of us just go to work. Yeah, it's a brilliant quote. Yeah, and, it and is. I remember showing up to work with my best mate, who's a who was a plumber. Every morning, I sensed that I was getting plumber's block. <laughs> but <laughs> not once did Tone come to the client and say, I'm really sorry I've got bad plumber's block today. <laughs> We're going to piss off and we'll come back another day. That's right. And it's exactly the same in my studio. Every morning we live a long way south of Sydney. It's very high and very cold. Mm. I get to the studio in the morning, it's freezing cold. I don't feel like working most mornings. Uh, the studio has no windows, um, as little distraction as possible. Mm. It's just, and it's also nowhere near the door, so I can't hear people knocking, and no one knows I'm in there either. Mm. And the scale of that studio means that you, as you mentioned, you can do pretty much anything. You can wield any materials in those massive canvases. The larger single canvas in the exhibition is the work that's now held in the Art Gallery of New South Wales collection, and, and Ben uh, literally manipulates those canvases on his own. When you're making the raw sharks, you call in, particularly in the case of Irina Ringi, because you had not recently... Well, you, you were actually injured at that point. Mm. So you had Mira some assistance. So, But generally, that is still a kind of place of solitude. I mean, I, I've seen you working, but not... I wouldn't say I've seen you working a lot over the last 25 years or so. That, which brings me to a question that I have. Did you ever see Margaret Ollie painting? Yes, yep. Yes, she she wouldn't stop for me. <laughs> no. no way. I'd walk in, she'd say, get a seat, sit there, and she would keep, always keep working. In fact, it was a real privilege. The more we got to know each other, the more comfortable she felt with me being there, or I was thinking the more comfortable she felt with bossing me around. Yeah. Um, and I would sit next to her and get make tea or do whatever she needed mm -hmm. and to see her start on those brown surfaces that board with chalk yeah and chalk just chalk 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 and that chalk would stay there right through the process of making the painting mm. very inspiring actually to sit with her now it's funny Joan Livy were the only two people that I ever saw in her space who were allowed to go nuts touch stuff really? the first time I took them there Joey was he's always been a bit out of control yeah, I know. He was about yeah. four or five and I thought this is going to end poorly because yeah. Joe's going to scribble on the Rodan. <laughs> and I said, Joe, don't. And she scolded me. Did he she? can do what he likes and I wasn't allowed to move my fingers without asking. There is a fabulous painting of Joe as a hamburger in the exhibition. Don't miss it. But what you've said goes to the heart of something that you said yesterday, which is the special place that Margaret held for artists. And uh, I think, you know, just as she has encouraged artists, you have certainly, you have, I think, very important catalytic relationships with other artists too. Yeah. I'm kind of interested in that because back to the idea of the studio, it still can be a kind of solitary world, particularly because you're living outside of Sydney. And then when you engage, you, you jump in the deep end, Ben. That's, you know, I think that's the signature of your your practice but also your persona. You jump in the deep end. There are no shallow shallow pools for you. I, I, it's funny you talk about supporting young artists. I remember my first show, my first group show in Sydney was at Mary Place Gallery many years ago and I was Guy Maestri was in the show, Fiona Lowry, who's both of them went on to win the Archibald and mm -hmm. so did I. And an artist about 10 years older than me walked in with his mates, big guns, and said, oh, the future of painting in Australia is fucked. That, exactly that <laughs> language. And I'd just met Guido, Guy Maestri, who's become one of my friends. And I remember thinking at that point, 
I don't know if it is or it isn't, but that's such a negative thing to bring to young artists mm. having their first exhibition. Mm. And it actually fires me up to prove people like that wrong, I yeah. have to say. And I, I do have to temper that need to prove people wrong mm. sometimes yep. and control it. But well, I, I yeah, find or not. I mean, I actually think that's where you've done such great work in a way. But it's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's not healthy. You need, you know, I need to do more yoga like John McDonald. I was going to say, who are you gesturing towards there in the front <laughs> row? Um, to, the, to, not, to not care about what other people think or what other people do is not really in me, but I need to practice it more mm-hmm. because you criticised as a public person and I, I wasn't prepared for that. So Margaret was tough in that regard and, and she was also very, very clever. Ben and Margaret first met around the time of the Brett Whiteley Travelling Scholarship when you were awarded that and Margaret was one of the judges. And then Margaret started to become rather surreptitiously a curator and a collection developer across the country. What she would do was acquire the work of young artists, including the work of Ben Quilty, a suite of his Tirana paintings, and she would gift them to regional galleries. Uh, Those regional galleries were not always so happy to be told what should lie in their collection. But because there might be a cheque... Are you cheque talking from... about the one you're at? N- no. Lisa, I'm not talking the about the one that I'm at. <laughs> so I was at Newcastle Gallery when Margaret gifted a wonderful work at one of the Tiranas called One for the Road. She would say that. I was thinking about another. I was actually thinking about a state gallery, but I won't name any names. Art Gallery of New South Wales. I think I might be thinking about the Art Gallery of New South Wales. <laughs> yes. The curator was very upset that he had to take the work that Margaret had forced him. He told me he was bullied into accepting it. <laughs> So, and that was because, of course, a cheque might arrive, you know, the month before or the month after to help the acquisition of a major Cezanne or there was there were strings attached and Margaret knew it and she worked those strings. But she did so, it was not about self-interest, it wasn't about Ben's interest, it was actually about doing something that that museums and art galleries are not always great at doing. It was about making us more porous. It was about opening us up to the next generation and it was about kind of democratising the place. Mm. Very, very interesting. I mean, you've been very generous as well. There are two paintings in this exhibition that are in your collection. Sergeant P, I understand, was a work that was acquired through a fundraising campaign, which is phenomenal. And then as... Ben's generosity in response to that meant that uh, he gifted that beautiful, beautiful portrait of Kate Porter, which I think is one of the most harrowing works in the show. Mm. They sit side by side in the exhibition, which is a a lovely serendipitous thing. And a big thanks to Peter Mackay, who's somewhere in the audience for putting the show together so beautifully here in Queensland. Very good. So generosity is something that I think you and I, I want to talk about family a little bit now because I, Ben comes from a very, these guys too, but also thinking the other way. I'm kind of thinking about your parents actually and I'm thinking about their civic sensibilities. Mm. I'm thinking about the way that I think for you early on, the three of you boys had a sense of your critical kind of citizenry. You knew that you had a social kind of responsibility. Mm. Can you talk to that? Yeah, mum, mum was um, <clears throat> an atheist green voter who was actually dating Paul Keating when she met Dad, who was a Catholic president of the Young Liberal Party. <laughs> and we still tell wow. Dad we, should, we belong in the lodge. <laughs> um, how those two got together doesn't make a lot of sense, um, but they're still together and they're brilliant. They, they were terrified when I said I was going to art school, but I understand why. It's not their fault. That's the way the community is set up. Mm. Um, that, that is not a valued, um, accepted path for, particularly, I think, for a young man. Mm. We're meant to go and get a trade or Dad said I should have been a lawyer, which is just redi- insane. Um, <laughs> But mum and dad, we could do any subject we wanted at school, freedom for that, but we had to do debating. And dad always said, if you do what you love, no matter what you do, if you love it, you'll be successful. Yeah. And I was pretty good at art. I ducked every year. And then, at, and I was the eldest son. And at, in halfway through year 12, dad said, hey, have you decided what you're going to do? And I said, I'm going to art school. 
think I'm going to art school and he, he just went, changed colour. I mean, it was, it's, he, he, I thought he died actually. <laughs> and my brothers just went into attack mode in their brilliant debating that he <laughs> taught them yeah. Yeah. and Dad lost the debate. <laughs> um, and, and mind you, I'd had a careers advisor the year before when I told the careers advisor I thought I might go to art school. He s changed, moved his glasses on his nose and said, <laughs> I think you should um, reconsider that. In fact, I'm going to suggest to your parents that you re-enrol in 300 economics. So I dedicated the exhibition to him. It's <laughs> very um, good. But to your point, mum and dad, I think, yeah, it was just without saying that you have to give, you have to stand up for people, there was always a sense of, um, I don't know, it's just sec I think everyone should be like that, to yeah. care about other people. Some, and, I, and I do believe my mum particularly, but mum and dad, taught me how to feel other people's pain very early. I remember being in year three and a little girl with beautiful long pigtails, plaits, I was of Italian heritage, her parents were Italian, her name was Magda and the boys in year six would pull her pigtails and call her maggot, maggot and throw food at her and, mm. and I remember thinking, I still, still makes me well up thinking mm. there was nothing I can do, the feeling of powerlessness mm. that I felt and I was only in year three or four and there's no doubt that my parents somehow taught that to yeah. all three of their yeah. children. Yeah, absolutely. And that is uh, alive and kicking in the show. And really part of the rationale for the exhibition was about the fact that you know Ben's public persona, but getting to know the, the way he kind of paints with purpose is really the underpinning rationale for the whole exhibition. Your, your dad is, is really interested in Australian history and landscape. He mm. has quite a profound understanding. Well, he's travelled very, very widely wider than most Australians. And mm. I think in a sense he preempted some of the travel and some of the work that you are doing now. And I think back to when Ben and I went to Murujulu um, for a short trip ahead of an exhibition called Sappers and Shrapnel in 2015. And we were camped very close. Most of you would know that Murujulu is very close to the base of Uluru. And uh, it's actually where the intervention was, I think, first kind of staged in 97. And it is, um, it's Anangal country and we were there on a bush camp. We were, because um, it was a women's camp, we couldn't stay overnight. Um, so Ben and I would kind of travel in in the day and work and, with the artists who included the phenomenal jumpy desert weavers. If you've ever seen their work, a collective of women that work across the Anangal, Binjata, Yankanjata lands and into um, Western Australia as well. And also Fiona Hall before she was, um, of course, in Venice. And I, it was, we'd known each other for a long time even by then, but I was struck by how quickly and how comfortably you kind of got a sense of place, that you were, you knew you were not on home turf, you knew you were um, invited on country, but you just knew what to do. And I think that goes back to those codes of empathy and compassion and how that is deeply within you. That trip ended up being... I think really significant. Mm. Mary Pan and Ninika Lewis, two senior Anangal women who work across Armitage and across to Ernabella in the case of Ninika were there making work and the work was um, the work was called Jiroro Jiroro. Mm. And Jiroro Jiroro means to feel anxious in Pitinjara. Mm. And it's a word that um, it's, you know, it's repeated to give it emphasis. And it strikes me that this idea of kind of anxiety and what social and emotional and even political anxiety looks like is in your work, inhabits your work and yourself mm. very much. You said something very beautiful in the media launch yesterday. You said that my work is the way that I vent that anxiety, that I kind of vent that sense of frustration and also a sense of love and empathy. Mm. Can you... Let's go back to what happens when you get into that studio and when all of... when so much is playing out for you, you know, that so much is in your world, it's so noisy. Mm. I'm just making you even more stressed, really. No, you're not. Right now. 
<laughs> you don't make me stress, Lise. And then you've, you have, how do you make sense of that? Like, what does that moment look like? Those moments. Uh, I, look, I guess it comes back to that question of writer's block. And for me, if, if anxiety is a valuable emotion to drive a painting, then so is love, so is anger, uh, so are all feelings, sadness. Mm. Um, and there's paintings in this show that are covering all of those sorts of sensations and emotions. But if anxiety is the one thing that I'm really looking at at the moment have been for some time. And the, the idea of collective anxiety, how do we mm. teach mm. the next generation mm -hmm. about the risks and dangers of the future, which are far more profound than they have been in the past. Yeah. At the same time, to know that there are people in the community who are the contemporary version of the flat earthers mm. makes me feel very anxious mm. and furious. And to respond in my studio is a very healthy way to get that out. And I can do it for everything. Mm. The day there's painting in there, the, the day after my arm was executed. And that painting is just a way of venting the fury that I felt and grief. Mm. Um, so, and I think that's probably also partly what's the great desert Central Australian painters, our friends, I think they also use it in that same way. Yeah. More than just telling stories and more than telling their future sorry, telling their past for yeah. their young people's future. It's also a way of venting and relaxing and being in the zone. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I have to say that many years ago, because there was no... I felt like such a lack of acceptance at my choice to go to art school, that therefore I felt that, that being in the zone is such a wonderful, empowering sensation that it could only be self-indulgent. And very early on I started thinking, I need to employ this and maybe it's Catholic guilt that somehow seeped into me from Dad. <laughs> somehow use that to then tell more important stories, that it's not just about enjoying your studio practice and yeah. being in the zone, that it has to be about more. Yeah, that sense of responsibility. And after that trip in Murajula, you the very important relationships formed, relationships that continue. And then the way that you have managed to seek out, I'm thinking about Richard Flanagan, I'm thinking about the your kind of peers and colleagues and close friends and brothers and sisters in arms in many ways. I mean, those the relationship network to me seems to a radical, a radical gesture for you because you realise what you can do through paint but it's also that you know what you can do through those particular networks and by um, mobilising other people's talent. You are very mm. good at mobilising other people's talent. So is Richard Flanagan. I mean, it's funny, Flan's always telling me, oh, you should look after yourself, you take on too many causes. Coming from you, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Um, but and we he shares the anxiety. I mean, actually, in some ways more so. Um, being from Tasmania, I'd be anxious too. <laughs> um, you've done yeah, it, he, you've done a few trips together, haven't yes, you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going back out to the desert soon, which is a huge privilege. Yakulti Napangadi, one of the great painters from from um, Kiwikura, which is across the West Australian border, and Richard, and she took us out to show us how to to catch bush food, which is one of the great privileges of being an Australian, Irish-blooded Australian, and to see her and Richard sitting together discussing the world for a whole day in that sun and in that extraordinary place, I thought two of the great, one of the greatest painters and one of the greatest writers of our time sitting in the desert, getting to the point of what our existence is about. Mm. I, you know, like my life was complete, you know. It's so you are, you are a matchmaker. You bring things together, mm. you make things happen. What, on the back of that, and, and on the back of this idea of it, it remains difficult, perhaps even more so, for young people to craft a creative life. I mean, mm. I, I think it is as broad as that. It is challenging for us to craft a creative life right now and for that to be valued. What advice have you got? Well, it's a good point. And for, you, for those of you who are involved in the arts closely, you'll know that art schools are just shutting down across the country. The whole TAFE art system was shut down recently under a government. Um, efficiency dividends to museums like this are a constant, constant 
distraction for executive, for the staff that run these museums, constantly working out how to survive mm. and being forced to bring income in for something that is actually nurturing the community and needs to be funded. Uh, uh, don't get me started, Lise, but you did. <laughs> um, if, you, if you go to the Institute of Sport, you would pay no hex, hex free. You have free education and you never repay it. And if you go back, if you become a star and go back, they'll give you around $100,000 free tax-free stipend to come back. Then if you win the stall grift running race for $100,000, that's also tax-free. As opposed to me or anyone in the arts, you studying anything in the visual arts or any of the arts, we repay entire university fees, which I don't complain about. I then also paid tax on the Brett Whiteley Travelling Arts Scholarship. I paid tax on the Archibald Prize. I paid tax on every single prize. So it's a polar opposite. And that injustice infuriates me. Absolutely. I think we at least deserve to be equal with the sporting mm. world. Yes. <laughs> here, here. The prize culture is really interesting because Ben has... It comes back to what Flano said about you. You're an insider and an outsider. You're a contradiction. You're your own raw shark. You have the capacity to be in the problem and also to be standing outside it and trying to fix it. And I feel as though you did that with Ar the Archibald Prize. I remember, was Whitey the first work you entered? Yeah, the mm. portrait of Whitey. When was that? Whitey, long time ago, 2004, I think. Yeah. And Ben said, I've got to be in it to change it. There was a lot of cynicism. There still is about art prizes and probably particularly about the Archibald. Mm. And you said, yeah, but I've got to be in it to, to be able to have that conversation. And that started a, a, a whole kind of history, in a sense, with you and the Archibald leading, of course, up to the win. But also, unlike a lot of Archibald winners, um, Ben still submitted work after he'd won it in 2011. But you decided to tackle it from the inside. And that strikes me as one of the you your character the traits. Well, that too, being on the board. But I'm just thinking that you decided to be in the building and to be in the belly of the beast rather than to kind of Trojan horse it, rather than actually just to be cynical and sit on the outside. And there's plenty of that in the art world. It can be quite divisive. Yeah, look, it's also $50,000 and I needed the money. <laughs> And the year after I won it, it went up to $100,000. <laughs> Did it really? Yeah, the year after. What's that about? You would have lost it in tax anyway, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, exactly. It put, yeah. that winning the Archibald put me into a higher tax bracket, yeah. which then got me into all sorts of financial trouble because I didn't know about tax brackets. What's that? Yeah, yeah. They just send me a bill and I pay it if I've got the money and if I don't, I start panicking. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that like everyone? Except yeah. the sports people, which they don't have to worry about it. Sorry, let's not keep going. So there's a very, very sweet interview between Ben and Margaret that you can see playing just in the kind of foyer out here and that you joke about the fact that you thought you were a shoe-in for that year because you'd painted Margaret Ollie and that was there any more obvious subject to win the Archibald. Ky Kylie, who's not here, my beautiful wife, said to me every year, because it is a big thing, you, you get sucked into the vortex of the Archibald and you, subjects and all your colleagues, artist colleagues, and it's a lovely way to come together with all those artists. It's exciting and it's a buzz. And the fact that people around the country focus on something in the arts is a win. In, you know, mm -hmm. I don't care what it That's is, true. that we get people who don't generally look at art, looking at art, 10 out of 10. Yep, agreed. Um, and Kylie kept saying, it started to do my head in a bit, and there's artists who've entered it 30 times in a row and never been accepted. So it's a chaotic sort of mess of maelstrom of art people. And she, Kylie kept saying, just get it over and done with and paint Margaret Ollie <laughs> and you'll win. And I was like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> it's just, it felt like I wanted to win it on my terms. Then I finally got sick of trying to win it on my terms and I re <laughs> really needed the money. <laughs> and so I went and saw Margaret and said, Margaret, I want to paint you for the Archibald. And, and she said, no. So then I had to talk her into it and then it won and the I got the money. History. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it, you, the, the work sits here, as you know, in the Margaret Ollie exhibition and just hats off to Quagoma for brilliant programming of the two exhibitions together. They fit together so beautifully. Uh, 
and and I think ask a lot of questions. The intergenerational dialogue, the way that you know each exhibition will build an audience for another, is a very exciting prospect to observe over the next few months. But that painting is a quite a contested one in the exhibition because it's the one work that Ben tried to talk me out of including in the exhibition. Because he, well, you talked to how you felt about it. Thanks for telling everyone that, Lise. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought it was a great painting. It should be in the show. <laughs> I, I felt like it's the painting that, that everyone thinks... Well, first of all, I get called an activist, and I'm an artist. I make paintings, and I want people to look at what I make and more and more realise that I need to speak through the work mm. and concentrate on being an artist. That's my best voice, really. Um, but the Margaret Ollie painting... Um, oh, look, hijack's the wrong word. Margaret slap my wrist but everyone knows that work so it feels like the obvious way forward and I always think that as an artist as a creative person if you can find a more difficult path mm. you in inevitably come out come to the end yep. with a more interesting yeah. product yeah. thing yeah I, I, and my rebuttal to that was that yes you think they know the work they don't know the work they haven't stood in front of the work no. they haven't had the opportunity for that the kind of in a way the the horror vacui, the white space that mm. you contemplate when you step up to the canvas, it hasn't spoken to them unless they've had that chance to stand in front of that work. Mm. The way it's hung in this particular exhibition is so beautiful too because it kind of calls you in, it lures you in. After experiencing Margaret's world, you get to, to experience her and it's a, it's a really masterful work. Thanks, Lise. Pleasure. <laughs> um, I just wanted to also recognise that, you know, the Art Gallery of New South Wales have been very generous with their loans and their portrait of Margaret Ollie by Bill Dobell that won the Archies there. Exciting to see that, but I must admit what I was more excited by is the small gouache study that sits alongside it that I had never seen in my life. Um, and that's why these exhibitions are very important. The balance between what you think people think about Ben Quilty, the sense that, yes, we know him, this is what he does, and then those unexpected moments in the show. In thinking about your show, I think it's... I think we've managed to pack a lot of a kind of, well, quite a dense emotional journey into what is ostensibly the last predominantly 15 but almost up to 20 years. It really underscores, well, A, the necessity of the exhibition, but B, just how much has happened to you and for you uh, and how much you have enacted yourself, you know, the way that you have been, had such agency. I think that's spoken through, through the exhibition. How does... L last night you shared the fact that, you know, half of the show is where you're working from a life model and the other half is where you are working from photographs. To me, there's this connection. You don't necessarily divide those two pathways. There's such a connection. And this vanitas motif is the thing that keeps this, this absolute confrontation of mortality is the thing that runs through them. And, it, of course, that's the thing that Margaret was playing with in her still life paintings. I mean, that's the thing that she was making sense of in her work itself. The work that's in the long gallery, which are the very, very gentle, very beautiful drawings that you've made on the wall, those drawings have been made, and I love this coming together, I think it's a really special moment, those drawings have been made by casting objects from Margaret's house as drawing tools. So the vessels that you see on the ground are actually cast jugs and vases that have been used by Ben, using a very tall scissor lift, to draw Margaret's face on the wall. Cast in chalk. Cast in chalk. That soft blue and pink chalk. Colours that probably neither of you have used that much in a way. It's a really gentle palette. That idea of of the kind of still life, you know. You've been talking about maybe doing some flower paintings because Margaret would have liked that. If um, There are a couple of flower paintings. Flowers for Heber is a very beautiful flower painting yes. in the exhibition and there's a portrait of Kylie, Ben's wife, wearing a pink dress that's covered in flowers in the exhibition. Mm. Can you talk about 
that kind of vanitas idea, that idea of those motifs, those notions. And I'm happy to go, let's go back to Tirana or let's go back to Budgie. Let's think about some of those symbols or all the way through to the life jacket. Yeah, Dad, Dad always said, had this saying that he, it was a mantra that he fed us, um, life's what you do while you're waiting to die. And, and he meant it in the most positive way. Don't waste a second. Hmm. And he also was, we, he homeschooled us for a few, mum and dad homeschooled us. We drove around Australia for two years, tw- two separate times. And I was in prim- year five the second time and year three the first time. And every night we'd sleep under the stars. Mum and dad slept in a little caravan. Their three boys slept out there with, <laughs> with the wild beasts. Yeah, dingo bait. Dingo bait on a, on a mattress, roll out mattress. Um, I think they'd come out every morning and say, ah, oh, they're still here. <laughs> um, but every night Dad would read us stories that he would be writing and, and often they, in, they were about mortality. They were about the end of the world and the endlessness of the universe. Mm. And it's something that our friends in Central Australia know Dad. so innately and not only just from me learning it because Dad made that decision mm. but because the thousand generations of their families have been dealing with those issues mm. Absolutely. and those concepts of the endlessness mm. of existence and, and who we actually are mm. and putting, our, putting ourselves into perspective, I guess. Mm. And that feeds into my work, there's no doubt about mm. it. It um, does. The, tar- the fir- early works were all about the, the, the f- strange way young men behave, really, um, and that f- f- laughing in the face of, of mortality, um, that celebration of decline. You have an 18th birthday party where you get really drunk and the next morning you're, the adults all expect you to wake up as an 18-year-old voting member of the public and then wonder why we all go so mental. Mm. Uh, and I then became very interested in Indigenous um, initiation, which mm. often takes up to 13 years mm. for boys to become men. So they become valuable, valued, mm. and members of the adult community with self-worth as well, mm. which are all, I mean, that's where it started, I guess. And that spectrum of masculinity continues. In the later work in the show, you know, we see Liam, who worked in the studio, but we also see Kenny... So th- that continued pursuit across a couple of decades now of masculinity, once again, you, your acknowledgement of being both inside and outside the problem, being kind of complicit in a sense, um, is one of the things that's propelled your practice. Now working with the life model, working with those male bodies, with your own and with the bodies in the studio, as a way of kind of calling up some of those, some of those demons and some of those difficulties. Yeah. Look, I, I guess I um. Yes, you, you you can't. I don't feel that I can make critical comments about parts of the community without involving myself. Yeah. And most of the problems with this, the society that I see it are my straight white men. Mm. So you've got to put yourself in there and say this is. Well, I'm part of it. I'm, I'm part of that legacy. Mind you, recently mum rang me up and got really angry at me and said, stand up for yourself. I had three straight white boys and I'm proud of you all. Interesting. Um, I tell them to ring me, stop attacking you and ring me. I said, no, mum, I'm not giving your phone number out. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I think you can't... There's uh, most recently I was very really attacked about the Santa Claus, the Kenny paintings yep. of turning Santa the Kenny into a life model into this notion of a straight white male figure that I could then use as a a prop, I guess, to critique the notion of myself and my fellow men. And Andrew Bolt hated those paintings, mm. which means they must have been all right. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you, right. you've got to, I do believe that you can't, I really don't think it's fair to just attack anybody mm. without, and that really is the big problem now that we all deal with, and that's social media. Mm. When I was young, my fa- particularly dad would say, sit on that letter overnight. He still does it, sit on that letter. Yep. And 99% of the time the next morning you won't send it. Mm. Whereas with a tweet, it's out there and it's mm. always fuelled by anger and mm. it's caused this huge rupture in our communities. 
Um, anger is the wrong, wrong first step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. It, we had a bit of time together to look at Margaret's show and I guess I'm always curious about what artists prize in their own lives, what works they might have in their own collections, the works that stop you in your tracks, the kind of works that you're drawn to. I, Tell me. I have a Sylvia Ken. She's an yeah. unbelievable painter and we should all know her name better than me, better than my name. She is a gun. She just won the win prize. Um, I have it. Yeah, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Uh, it's the best thing about being in this country for me and the, the longer I live here, the more I realise the greatest thing about this country is, I mean, I'm a bit biased, is that art being made in those communities right now. Yeah. Um, and um, people say, why do you go there? You know, it's like, why did I want to meet Ai Weiwei? Why did I meet want to meet Richard Flanagan. I wanted to meet Sylvia Ken for the same reason. Yeah. And I, you, she helped me. Lisa Slade has done more. You ask any of those big gun artists who's helped them more than anyone else, they all say Lisa Slade. Kind. It's true. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things, when Ben goes to, to visit communities, you're you're just going as an artist. That's the other thing. I mean, I think people have been quite critical and cynical in a way, but it's like you're just going as an artist. Sylvia Ken doesn't know who, who or care who Ben Quilty is. Well, they're also, they, well, they're still being pigeonholed. Indigenous yeah, artist Sylvia yeah. Ken. They don't say Irish-blooded yeah, Australian artist yeah, ben, Quilty. ben Quilty. Yeah. Why do we have to call yeah. Sylvia an Indigenous yeah. artist? So She's a fucking great artist, excuse the language, Joan Libby. <laughs> They've never heard that before. <laughs> And what happens then is this fantastic exchange and I, I was so excited to hear about how Ben's painting practice has kind of changed. Like once you've, once you've looked at artists who work, who move the canvas, who move around the canvas, who, who are in the canvas and kind of in on country in a way and in the landscape, and then I think about the physical act, the way that you've made paintings and continue to make paintings, it makes such sense that you have so much to say to each other mm. as painters. And I, I just, this, both of the exhibitions and even the John Mulvig, which is what is coming up later in the year, they're, they're celebrations of this act of painting and I, I don't think it's lost its charm. I mean, you won't see much of it at the Venice Biennale, for instance, right now. You won't see much of it probably at the Sydney Biennale coming up or at the National recently. Having said that, a fantastic exhibition of Michael Armitage's paintings opened last night at the MCA. So we are having a bit of a moment, potentially, or maybe paintings Look, always Adrian had Look, Adrian Gini got the greatest reviews at the Venice Biennale. He's a great painter. For those of you who don't look, you should look. Yeah. Um, Mulvig's coming up here. Yeah. Hu in my opinion, hugely underrated yeah. artist. That's a very exciting thing coming here. Had some more paint. Um, I think in the 80s there was this notion, and I, I was interested in the theory of the end of painting, really interesting. But it's not true. No, it's not true. You, you tell a young 18-year-old guy at art school who's there to paint that, and there was no one painting in the painting department, um, the painting's dead, you're going to cause a rebellion. You're going to en enable Dana Schutz, Adrian Gini, all the greatest artists in the world, yeah. Sylvia Ken. I mean, they didn't even, pay, they don't need no. to pay attention. It's just going to keep punching out of them and no one's going to stop it. Yeah. So your favourite painters, if I think of the triangle of you and Margaret, I think of, you know, Chardin and I think of some of those fabulous kind of still life painters and you were, when we looked at Margaret's show together, you stopped in front of the painting of the crustaceans, I think, that Quagoma mm. have recently acquired and you were kind of drawn to that work. Yeah, it's beautiful painting. I mean, it's just that freshness of, in the end, painting is just looking at an object and responding and responding to giving your sensation of feeling that space. Mm. You can smell the, fre the fresh seafood sitting in front of Margaret. You can hear the ocean through that blue window. It's also a really hard um, construction, that painting. To pull that off, you need to know how to do that painting. Mm. And she nailed it. Mm. And I'd never seen it as well, so it's like, oh, my goodness, I've never seen this painting. And my friend made it. Mm. That idea of um, the, the canvas or the surface as a place in which all of those things are played out, even with the, the 
the seemingly benign nature of still life, I think, is, is the thing that makes painting such a, an abiding, enduring and relevant practice. This is probably our final. We're mm. probably just about out of time. But you said to me when we opened the show in Adelaide in um, early March that you couldn't wait to get into the studio, that you were just... It drew a line. Big projects do, as you all know, and you just couldn't wait to get back in and kind of make some paintings that were not framed by the context of the exhibition. So what's so, been happening? Someone said to Kylie at the Arco South Australia opening, you'll have to be really careful because he's going to crash when he goes back to the studio. And Kylie said, no, you know, he's not. If we have a holiday that's more than a week, Kylie starts shortening the holiday because Quilty needs to go back to the studio. <laughs> yeah. and she's like, go back there and sort yourself out. Yeah. Um, it's my happy place. It's where I'm at my best. It's where I am in the zone. It's where I can sort out the own, my own problems. I'm not... None of us are normal. Human beings are far from normal. Spend some time looking in the mirror at yourselves. <laughs> Honestly, after about half an hour, you start to really think what a strange thing we are. Or go into the CAC. <laughs> yeah. That might be a bit weird, all the adults go into the CAC. Yeah. But, but, yeah, look, contemplate yeah. your own. Yes. Well, yeah. that's... that's oh, a... And so what am I doing now in the studio? Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's time to have some time just to make beautiful paintings mm. of still life, of just look down and... But saying that, I just made a painting of Fraser Anning and he's far from beautiful. <laughs> Very good. So I can't promise, Lisa, that there'll be much calm beauty yet. But I know that I'm not alone in saying this. We can't wait to see what it is. Thank you, Lisa. Congratulations, Thank you. Ben Quincy. Thanks for having me. Thank you so Thanks, much, guys. everyone. Thank you.